What's up, students? Hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today, another modern physics lesson. This is going to be the part two of nuclear reactions. If you haven't seen part one, I'll leave the link. You can go back and check that out first. This is designed for anybody taking the SAT physics, maybe an advanced high school physics course, or even your first year one-on-one type physics course. This will give you everything you need to know. Today, we're going to talk about radioactivity, alpha and beta decay, gamma rays, decay rate, and half-lives, as well as fusion and fission reactions. Let's dive right into this. So I think when we see the word like radioactive, we think that's bad thing. You know, somebody's going to get sick. We think Chernobyl. The guys, that's not only the, that's not always the case. Radioactive decay is simply when an unstable isotope spontaneously loses energy and emits particles from the nucleus. That's it. It's really just a splitting of the nucleus. Okay, not all nuclear reactions are quote radioactive. Radioactive just means that the decay is going to happen naturally, like without any trigger or fuse. Okay, and what this means is like not all elements are going to decay naturally. Not all elements create isotopes that are spontaneously going to lose energy and break down. There's only a specific amount of elements that do so, and those are what we call radioactive. Not all nuclear reactions are radioactive. And guys, the SAT physics and other phys courses like it, they're not chemistry classes. So we don't necessarily need to know all the elements and all of their uh, atomic masses and, and their atomic numbers, things like that. It's more going to be looking at balancing nuclear equations as far as mass and charge are concerned. Okay, so this is what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to balance mass numbers and also atomic numbers. And then we're also going to have to identify the types of radioactive particles and the types of radioactive decays. So we're going to look at identifying alpha, beta, and gamma when it comes to decay. So we're going to have alpha, we'll have beta, and then we'll have gamma. So let's look at the differences here. So we remember that an alpha particle is really just the nucleus of a helium atom. It has an atomic number of two and a mass number of four. So in an alpha decay, an alpha particle, aka helium nucleus, is going to be emitted. This will make the mass number decrease by four, and it'll make the atomic number decrease by two. If we talk of the harm or the danger of these particles, alpha are the least harmful. They can be stopped by our skin. So it's really, really only harmful to us if we ingest it. So let's look at what I'm talking about as far as like finding the products and looking at how we can balance these two. The first, let's say I have an isotope of uranium. It has an atomic number of 92, and we'll say that this is uranium-238. Now, in the first case, I'm going to tell you that this uranium goes through alpha decay. And they want to know what is going to be the result, what element's going to be the result of this alpha decay. Well, we know that if we started with 92 and we have 2 here, there's going to have to be a 90 here. And the atomic number is going to tell us that this is going to be thorium. And this would be probably in a multiple choice type question. So you don't need to know, once again, that thorium is 90. But we also need to know that the mass number is going to decrease by 4. So one thing you're going to be able to have to do is you're going to be able to have to balance this. Like I said, these choices would be in a multiple choice. You'd say like thorium 92, 248, things like that. You need to know this decreases by 4, this decreases by 2. The other type of question is that they'll give you this and this and ask you what type of decay it is. Here's an example. Say they tell us that there's thorium 227 here. And after going through some decay, what's left is radium 88 to 23. And they'd want to know, well, what is going to be left over? What type of decay was this? Well, we see that it decreased by two and four. That would tell us that this was alpha decay. And that is what you're going to have to be able to do in each one of these types of decay. So let's go right into beta. Remember from the first video that a beta decay is really just an electron. Okay, and this happens when a neutron decays into a, a proton and an electron. So we start with a neutron, and then it decays down into a proton plus an electron. This is a beta decay. Now, this travels at really high speed. It has more energy than the alpha decay, but this can also be stopped with a thin metal, like, say, aluminum. So not incredibly dangerous, not something we really need to worry about. 
But what we need to do is we need to do these two things. We need to be able to draw out what's going to be your remainder, what this transmutation is going to be after beta decay. And also we're going to have to be able to identify beta decay as well. Let's look at some examples. So I have carbon-14, and I'm going to say that it undergoes beta decay. We want to know what does carbon transmutate into. And in this example, we'll say that we have thorium-231, and it transmutates into neptonium-231. What type of decay is this? So if I'm going to decrease my proton number by one, I'm going to need a seven here. Nothing happens to the mass number, so that's going to be 14, and the atomic number seven is nitrogen. This will see that the proton number decreased, the mass number stayed the same, this is beta decay. So gamma rays, gamma rays are going to appear in both of these types of decay. Okay, so they're not always going to be here in alpha beta, but this is where they're going to appear. And these are a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So they travel the speed of light. They have an extreme amount of energy, really, really high frequency. So we're going to need some lead to stop these guys. And they will explicitly tell you that gamma is present because gamma, guys, does not have any mass or charge. So it would not affect the atomic mass or the mass number. So they will tell you if gamma is present. And we remember exactly what a gamma ray, guys. It's, it's a high energy type of photon, and it's emitted when neutrons and protons fall energy levels inside the nucleus. Now let's talk about the decay rate. How fast does beta decay, alpha decay, how, how fast does this happen naturally? So the rate at which radioactive decay, decay that happens naturally, the rate at which it happens is known as the half-life, known as half-life. So you might have seen this in chemistry as well. And all half-life is, it says that we have a certain amount of an element. Let's say we have 16 grams of carbon-14. Well, what the half-life is, it's the amount of time, this time interval here, for this to break down to 8 grams. And then the same exact half-life will happen again and break this down into 4 grams. So this period of time is known as the half-life. And every radioactive element that naturally decays has its own specific half-life. But now as we just saw from beta decay, there has to be a resulting element that gets transmutated out. What I mean is when carbon-14 goes through a radioactive decay, another element must be formed. And the decay of carbon-14 is a beta decay. So initially, it's going to have no other elements, but as it decays, it's going to turn into nitrogen. So what it would look like is I would have zero grams now of nitrogen-14. But now as this half-life goes on, the same half-life, now I have eight grams of nitrogen-14. And then as another half-life of carbon goes on, I will have 12 grams of carbon-14. Sorry, that's not 4, that's 14. So as we see, as the carbon number goes down, the nitrogen number goes up. And I used carbon-14 as an example. So, guys, you might have heard of carbon dating. Now, here's essentially what carbon dating is. Carbon-14 is created in the Earth's atmosphere, like our upper atmosphere, and it's caused by, you know, cosmic rays coming down and hitting nitrogen gas atoms. So carbon-14 is absorbed by plants and animals, and it appears in those plants and animals at the same concentration as what's in the atmosphere. Now, when an animal dies, it stops absorbing this carbon-14, and this natural radioactive decay process starts. So what they can do is they can look at the amounts of nitrogen and look at the amounts of carbon and they can use the known half-life of carbon to identify how old fossils and other things are. It's really awesome, to be honest. And they're going to give you the half-life for each element and they're going to say, how many half-lives would it take carbon-14 to get to 4 grams if it starts at 16 grams? So you would say, okay, this is just one half-life. It would take two half-lives for carbon to get from 16 down to 4. The last thing we need to talk about, and then I'm going to get you guys out of here, is fission and fusion reactions. Okay, and common types of both.
Now, these types of nuclear reactions, unlike radioactive decay, are going to need some triggers, right? They're not going to happen on their own. Now, the trigger for fusion is it needs a free neutron. So what this free neutron is going to do, it's going to go inside the nucleus of one of these elements and make that nucleus unstable. And then that nucleus is going to split apart. Because as we saw in the last video, the strong force is only going to act at very small distances. So when I add another neutron, it spaces those protons out, then the electrostatic force splits that atom up. And the most common type of fission reactor, this is what nuclear reactors use, guys. And here's essentially what happens in a nuclear reactor. They take an unstable, Uranium-238. Now, it's right on the breaking point, but not ready to split. It's like borderline sketchy. But then when I come in and I add a free neutron, this nucleus gets super sketchy. And this uranium transmutates into two other elements. It transmutates into krypton and barium. And you don't need to know what it transmutates into. What you guys need to understand is that here's the thing that makes nuclear reactors crazy. This reaction in itself causes three more fuses. And then the other result is energy, a ton of it. So in a nuclear reactor, the craziness that's going on is that we give it one little trigger, but then it gets three more to continue what we're going to call a chain reaction. So for every one uranium-238 that splits, three more can get split. So you can see this is going to be an exponential chain reaction. Then it uses this energy, and what it does is it uses energy, heats water, steam is produced, a turbine is produced, and we get mechanical energy that is now going to be converted into electrical energy. That's how a nuclear reactor works. So these reactions are easier than fusion. But you need to find uranium-238. Also need a way to keep this under control so this chain reaction doesn't get cray like what happened at Chernobyl. And also, we are going to need to make sure we get rid of all this nuclear waste as well. Besides nuclear reactors, we're also seeing fission a lot, guys, in nuclear submarines as well. The other type of big one is a fusion reaction. So in fission, guys, we are going to get a splitting of atoms. In a fusion, we're going to fuse or put together smaller atoms to make a bigger one. And the thing about fusion, guys, is it requires a ton of energy to get it going. Its trigger is a ton of energy that's needed. This is most commonly found in stars like our sun. And if you've ever wondered if our sun is actually giving off energy, think about how far away it is. You guys know how far away it is. And do you feel its heat? Yeah, that, that heat is the energy that you feel from the fusion reaction that's going on on the sun. And if you think about the fusion bomb that was created, pretty much used deuterium, which is just isotopes of hydrogen that are called deuterium. When they come together, they create alpha particles and a ton, guys, so much energy. But these are gases, guys, they're hard to contain and they need a lot of energy to get going. They need a ton of pressure, a lot of energy to turn this into an alpha particle. And in the hydrogen bomb, they actually used a fission reaction and they used the energy of the fission reaction to make these deuterium atoms combine to cause alpha and then once again, another huge energy output. That locks up part two of nuclear reactions, guys. If you have any questions, please let me know. Make sure you go back and check out part one. Until I see you guys in the next one, have a great day.